It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, how did the Premier decide that pleasing his radical social conservative friends was a higher priority than protecting the human rights of Ontario students? So I'm going to start off by cautioning the members on inflammatory language that, uh, that inflames the House. Um, I, 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 heard, I heard part of the question, but then I, the reaction, I couldn't hear the whole question. I'm going to allow it. The Premier, response. Well, well through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I, uh, I accept uh, the opposition's uh, radical comments. And friends, we don't, uh, you know something? We're, I, I, know, I know the NDP don't believe in this, but we believe in, in doing something that they don't believe in, and that's actually consulting with parents. Here, here. I know that's unusual. And I, I think, and I think, and I think they know that the, the consultation, as they propped up the, the Liberals for 15 years on every issue, including this one, they went online. They went online and consulted with 16 people after the curriculum was already put together. So they believe that's proper curriculum, I mean consultation. We believe in consulting with the parents. But do you know what's even more important, Response. Mr. Speaker? More important are the math tests. The, where, where our students are, grade six math students, 50% of them are failing math. Oh, okay. That's what we're- Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary, Member for London West. Speaker, this morning, human rights lawyers were here at Queen's Park to launch legal action against the Premier's dangerous plan. I applaud the work that these advocates are doing. They are speaking up on behalf of students, including an 11-year-old child who will suffer significant harm if the Premier is allowed to erase gender identity, same-sex families and LGBTQ2 issues from Ontario schools. Speaker, why is this Premier violating the human rights of children across Ontario. Premier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know like the NDP, they like fear mongering. Yep. But we're gonna we're gonna actually consult with parents. We're gonna focus on math scores. We're gonna focus on math and science, which we should be focusing on again when half our students are failing math, we have an issue. When the grade six students are the lowest in all of Canada, we are the lowest in all of Canada Shot. under the old curriculum. Opposition We're going to fix the old curriculum. We're going to make our students the top in the country. Here, here. Final supplementary. Speaker, the 1998 curriculum fails to provide the information that students need to stay safe, and it fails to respect the human rights of Ontario students. Right. That is why 30 school boards, representing about two-thirds of all children in this province, have issued formal statements raising concerns about the risks and direct harm that the Premier's plan will create. Speaker, school boards and teachers want to protect the health and human rights of their students. Why doesn't this Premier. Premier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we're going back to the NDP math. They can't add up. There's actually altogether 76 school boards, and we're going to consult with the folks at the school board. But most important, Mr. Speaker, most important, we're going to consult with the parents. The number one issue is not the sex ed. It's math scores. Yep. It's about educating our students. They're and I know, I know the opposition. I know the opposition. <laughs> Any, anyone, anyone before 2014? Yeah. Anyone over 2014? I guess they just didn't get it. Yeah. They didn't get it. We're going back to 2014. We're going to consult with the parents, yeah. both on on math, on sciences, Spons. but also on the sex ed. And once we consult with the parents, that's when we'll make our decision. Thank you. Members will take your seats. 
Next question. Start the clock. Member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Young children and their families should not have to fight the Premier of this province just to make sure that every child is supported in our classrooms. So why is this Premier forcing families to launch legal challenges just to ensure that the human rights of our kids are protected this September? Premier. Mr. Speaker, we're going to have the ro most robust consultation this here, province here. has ever seen. Here, here, here. We're going to go to all 20, 124 ridings. And you know what's really ironic, Mr. Speaker? I'm going to go into some of these ridings that people in their ridings are dead against the sex ed. They're dead against our kids failing math. And there's actually people that were elected in certain areas that I know personally. Brampton, for example, my friend over in Brampton, they know, both candidates know from Brampton how their people feel in Brampton. They're dead against it. So we're going to pay Brampton a visit. We'll go pay Scarborough a visit and see what their parents actually think. Because I know what their parents think. They're dead against it. They want to be consulted. They're actually keeping their kids out of school. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I want you to know that the people in Waterloo, they care about consent, and they care about the safety of the kids in our schools. Every day, Mr. Speaker, more and more people are speaking out against the Premier's dangerous plan to drag students back to 1998. 26 school boards, um, 30 school boards now, have issued statements of concern. They're taking a stand, and I'm very proud Government of those school boards. Order. Also, 1,800 health care professionals say the Premier's plan put children at risk. And now the Premier is facing legal action from the families of children who will be harmed by your actions. Why is this Premier not interested in protecting the health and the human rights of, an, of all Ontario students? Premier. Mr. Speaker, through you, do you know what puts our children at risk? Is when we don't consult their parents. That's what puts your children at risk. What puts our children at risk is when we don't consult with the parents and we listen to a bunch of politicians, we listen to a bunch of activists. That's what puts our children at risk. What we should be doing is consulting with the parents that we're going to do right across 124 ridings. We're going to reach out to the parents. We're going to actually reach out to the experts. We're going to reach out to anyone that's involved, even the teachers. I know the leader, I, I, know, I, know, they don't, I know they don't believe in reaching out to teachers because I talk to teachers throughout the campaign. They don't agree with the curriculum. They don't agree with the math curriculum. They don't agree with the sex ed curriculum. They don't agree Thank you. Member, the Premier will take a seat. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you very much. What I would like to say to this Premier is that this issue is so important. It's too important to play politics with, Mr. Speaker. Side, please come to order. According to, according to one parent, having. I apologize. Stop the clock. The government side has to come to order. I have to be able to hear the member asking the question. Restart the clock. Member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. According to one parent, having the 2015 curriculum at her child's school taught him how to have a voice and to acknowledge that there's nothing wrong with him. But the Premier's plan to scrap the health curriculum and erase same-sex families, gender identity and consent from Ontario's classrooms, this will hurt students across Ontario. Why is this Premier sacrificing the human rights of students just to return a political favour to his socially conservative friends? Through you, Mr. Speaker, I don't remember ever saying anything that the other members said we were saying on the campaign. It's fear mongering. Yep. They try to put fear into Sad. the people of Ontario, the Painful. students of Ontario. 
And, and is it the same parents? Only 1,600 people were consulted. Over 14 million people are in this province. 1,600 people were consulted. The numbers are fudged. Something is wrong here. But I can promise you one thing, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be traveling around this province. We're going to hear from the parents. We're going to hear from the teachers. We're going to hear from the experts. And they're going to decide. And we'll bring it back into the house here. And then we will have the proper math curriculum. We'll have the proper here, here. sex ed curriculum. Here, here. Next question, the member for Timmins. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, your government trounced on the democratic process by making a unilateral decision to slash Toronto City Council without any real public consultation. Now you're using time allocation to force through the legislation while preventing the public to appear before the committee to have their say. Public consultation and the use of committee is a democratic process that has long been cherished. How can you purport to be a government of the people when you won't let them into the building to have a say about their legislation? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for giving me the opportunity through you to, uh, to speak to the member. Again, we were very, very clear, Crystal during, clear. during the campaign that we were going to reduce the size and cost of government. I'm actually pleased that the, that the NDP actually want to talk about Bill 5 rather than the drive-by smears that they've been doing in this House the last two days. <laughs> Bill 5 is going to provide a streamlined City Council. It's going to provide an efficient and effective council. It's going to provide $25 million savings for the people of Toronto over the next four years. It's going to provide, on October 22nd, the opportunity to have a streamlined 25-member council with the same boundaries Bonds. that are in the federal MPs, the same boundaries that are in the provincial MPs, it, MPPs. It's good public policy. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Anything but clear you have been on this bill. Never raised it in the last election once. Nobody seen this thing coming. It all of a sudden got announced one day out of the blue. And you're saying that you're not going to allow the people of this province and the people of these cities affected to come before public committee and have their say? You can't pretend to be a government of the people when you won't open the front door to the legislature and allow the people to come in and to present that committee. Will you open the door and will you allow the people into this committee structure to have their say? Response, Minister. Speaker, through you to the member, it's pretty rich coming from the NDP that just ran a campaign that was anti-police, anti-veteran, anti-poppy. Cannot hear the Minister of Stop the clock. <laughs> Once again, I have to inform the House I have my earphone in and I have the volume full blast, and I can't hear the member who has the floor. That can't be allowed to happen. Okay, we restart the clock. Next question. The member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people have remained committed to public safety across this great province. The daily duties of a police officer are dangerous, and the brave men and women of our police services deserve to perform their duties safely and effectively. 
As members of this House are aware, Ontario has seen an increase in the number of gun and gang-related violence taking place on our streets. Gun violence is a menace to our streets and will not be tolerated, Mr. Speaker, by this government. Speaker, could the minister please update the members of this legislature on how his ministry will tackle the problem of gun and gang-related violence? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member from Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, for the, this very important question. At the outset, I just want to thank our first responders for the great work that they do to keep our community yeah, safe. Yeah. Speaker, it's time to put public safety first. Our government for the people is listening to police and investing real money to help them protect families and gang and gun violence. Mr. Speaker, during the election campaign, we promised to restore the $12 million in funding that the previous government cut from the fight against gangs and gun violence. Today, we're investing $25 million in new Unlike the members of the official opposition who have continually insulted the men and women of our police services, our government order, order, order. Member can take a seat. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the minister for his response in this incredibly important topic. This announcement of additional funding to the police services is needed to address the problem of gun and gang-related violence in Ontario, and especially within the City of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, as a member of this government for the people, I'm proud to stand here today and know that we have kept another promise we made to the people of Ontario. Speaker, the, men and, the brave men and women of our police services desperately need the tools and resources to address gun violence, and I know the minister will continue to deliver on this government's commitment to ensuring public safety across this great province. Again to the minister, what actions will your ministry be taking to ensure that the streets of Toronto and all of Ontario and the many communities Question. remain safe? Minister. Thank the member for uh, his question. Mr. Speaker, our government has kept the promise we made to improve public safety within this great province. This new investment in our police services will allow Toronto Police Service to purchase equipment and innovative technologies for their important task of tackling gun and gang violence within the City of Toronto. The time for talk is over, and we're delivering real action to keep our neighbourhoods safe. We're challenging the municipal and federal governments to also step up to do their part and support our police services. Mr. Speaker, we will continue meeting with our community safety partners over the coming weeks so that we can find solutions necessary to protect Ontarians from being the victims of senseless violence and to keep our first responders safe Spons. while performing their duties. Mr. Speaker, promise made, promise, promise kept, promise doubled. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, when did the government inform participants of the basic income pilot program that the program was to end, and have they been informed when they will no longer receive the income they have come to count on? Premier. The question was addressed to the Premier. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we had a little issue. For the people at home, we're, we're, we're dealing with a serious issue on the other side of the aisle. We have one of the members from, from Essex just tell us he's going to throw a landmine and blow this place up. That's a, you know, I think, the cheese, I think the cheese has slipped off the cracker with this guy. But when he is threatening to blow this place up, that's a serious, serious issue we're facing. And he said we're bringing a landmine. Premier will take a seat. Yeah, yeah. The pre Premier will take a seat. Supplementary question. 
Back to the Premier. My constituent, Sherry Metawagan, was to wasn't told by this government about this life-altering decision. Instead, she learned about it over social media. What Sherry and others have since heard from the program administrators is that their last payment will be at the end of August. Sherry had enrolled in school, had plans to use basic income as a step out of poverty. Not anymore. And Donna George Morrison, whose father was a World War II veteran and her mother a victim of the residential school, was on disability and caring for her eight year old grandson. She's on, on basic income, she could buy food, fruit, meat. Now she Question. will have to go back to food banks. What does the Premier say to Sherry and Donna? Premier. Services. Community Social Services. Question, and it gives me an opportunity to update the House with things that I said yesterday that uh, clearly the member opposite wasn't listening to. Um, first of all, I want to assure her that Sherry and Donna are being listened to. Uh, we have heard them. I have staff are in the gallery, and we want to make sure that when we wind this program down, and the details will emerge in the next couple of weeks on how we're going to do that, it will be a compassionate and lengthy runway so people will still receive their checks for the next uh, few months. But I will tell you this. This is a program that, if it were fully implemented, would cost $17 billion, raising the HST to 7 uh, to 20 percent, an additional 7 percent. That would impact the poor of this province, the vulnerable. And right now, we have one in seven people that are living in poverty. And our job as a government for the people is to lift them up, to give them a pathway to success, and when they're able to work, get them into get them into that pathway. But She'll when they don't have those skills and when they're unable to do that, we have to support them. So that's why we Response. have the pause button. Uh, on the Liberal plan that was patchwork and fragmented, it's decided to give a 1.5% increase in OTA. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, a member from Mississauga East Cookstone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister, I was shocked to read the story of convicted sex offender Adsania Prince, who is in Canada illegally. I see Mr. Prince, who has been convicted on child pornography charges, will be in Canada's prison system while he awaits extradition. Minister, the federal government, through Ministers Blair, Goodell, and Hussein, claim there is no crisis at the border yet more than a thousand illegal border crossers come into Canada each month. Many of these illegal crossers come across at Roxham Road. Minister, I understand this convicted sex offender also searched across the border into Canada at Roxham Road. Our border appears to be a path for illegal crossers, and now sex of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services responsible for immigration. For immigration, Speaker. Uh, I want to say thank you to the member for raising this very important issue. I heard uh, um, the uh, member opposite refer to that person as an asylum seeker. He is a, a child registered sex offender, and he crossed into our country at an uh, irregular port of entry in Quebec, and now he is, he, he, we, we are paying for him to be here. So this is a crisis, and it is because of the federal government's failed policies at our border, and the government has acknowledged that by, by ensuring that there was not one not two, not three, but four ministers in the federal government responsible for this crisis. This is a federal decision, and I will be going to Ottawa on Monday to ask for our $200 million in costs that continue to escalate in this province as a result of what's happening at the border. But this should be a shock and a concern for every Ontarian when a child sex offender can cross the, cross the border into our country and expect social services in this province. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you. Minister, thank you for that answer. I can't believe anyone would suggest this isn't a crisis. I appreciate your support, your position on this important matter. It would be a huge step in the right direction if Ministers Blair, Godel, and Hussein would finally admit they don't have a solution to this crisis. 
Now I hear the illegal border crossers will be put up in hotels for what I understand could be years. Minister, have the college facilities been vacated or will students now be negatively impacted? As well, could you please tell me if the federal government is paying millions per month to house illegal border crossers indefinitely? Thank you. Minister. Question. It gives me an opportunity to update this House. As you know, Speaker, last week Angus Reid found that two-thirds of Canadians agree with the Ontario government's uh, uh, approach on this, and every single Premier in the country agrees with our Premier and how Absolutely. we're approaching this. Yeah. And that is why we have gone to. Uh, I've gone personally to Ottawa, and I will go again to talk about the crisis at our border and the crisis in our emergency shelter system. I know that uh, we are a welcoming society, but our patience has been tested, as is our generosity, as a result of these failed federal policies that five ministers are now presiding over and pe passing as a hot potato. So I'm going to s simply say thank you to Centennial and Humber College for their generosity over this period of time. And, uh, to, uh, and, and I also just want to point out that the feds need to pay for their failed policies. $200 million is a lot of money, Mr. Speaker, and that's Ontario's Thoughts? money and that we need that back. So I will be going on Monday to speak to those federal ministers and demanding that we get compensated. Oh. The House will come to order. The member for Scarborough Southwest will come to order. The Premier will come to order. It's not helpful. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The Premier didn't campaign on cancelling democratic elections, and he seems to have taken everyone including his own caucus, by surprise. It was especially surprising because of news reports that the Premier's office was getting engaged in the Peel Regional Chair election. The Premier claims to have consulted people about this particular piece of government policy. Did the Premier consult with any former members of this House about regional chair elections? Premier. Mr. Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. To the member for Toronto Danforth, during the campaign, we talked about respecting taxpayers. The Premier talked to tens of thousands of people during that campaign. We were delivered here in this House with a strong mandate to get things done, and that's exactly what we're doing. We passed. The Urgent Priorities Act that got the, the, ended the, the longest strike at a university in Canadian history. The kids are going back to York University. We're on our way to reducing gas prices by 10 percent. This bill, Bill 5, will reduce the size of Toronto City Council and press the pause button on four elections in four Response. regions. Again, a Toronto Council made up of 25 members, will be a streamlined council. It won't be a dysfunctional council. It will be a Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I'm not surprised the Premier evaded that question. I'm going to go back to this, though, again to the Premier. Before the Premier decided to interfere in democratic elections, something he didn't run on, and none of the members across the House ran on, there were media reports that the Premier's people were trying to get someone, anyone, to run against Patrick Brown. Was the Premier in touch with Charles Souza about this matter? Premier, or rather, sorry, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, also. again, this has got nothing to do with the bill on the order paper. It's got nothing to do with government policy. It's just another drive-by smear by the NDP. You can howl all you want. But I'll again remind you, we're not the party that stood up against the police, against veterans, against the poverty. We weren't that party. We were the party. Members will take their seats. Members will take their seats. Members will take their seats.
Next question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and uh, Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, the Ring of Fire is truly a multi-generational economic and social development resource project that will positively impact the economy all across the north. And I believe that the minister will uh, agree that two of the keys to this project moving forward are the building of regional infrastructure to bring the minerals to market and a continued partnership with First Nations to see that benefits go to their communities. We know that three First Nations are working on all-season roads to open up access to the provincial highway network and the Ring of Fire. And, Speaker, when we were in office, we committed $1 billion to ensure that these access roads are indeed built. So the government's support for these uh, all-season roads is totally crucial. My question for the minister is this. Will the minister commit to making the necessary investments to see that the all-season roads are built? And will the minister continue to work in partnership with these willing First Nations to move the Ring of Fire forward? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the member opposite's uh, efforts over the past. Unfortunately, they haven't accomplished much. I was involved, obviously, in the other place and in my capacity as the minister for FedNor. And from time to time, we had a project or two. Uh, that we were able to work successfully on in an effort to open up corridors for hydro road access to First Nations communities, improve uh, all-season roads, Mr. Speaker, and actually get a road into the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker, to create jobs, economic development for Indigenous communities. Instead, Mr. Speaker, what we've seen is a bit of a bog. These communities are now no longer involved in the direct activity, the benefit and the opportunity save and except for a couple, of actually participating in the things that the Ring Bonds. of Fire can offer. I'm pleased to say that moving forward, Mr. Fink, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Ring of Fire is a top priority for us here, here. and those communities here, here. and all of Northern Ontario. Here, here. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm very pleased. Thank you very much for the response, Minister, and I'm very pleased that it's a top priority for uh, your government as it was for ours. And uh, I think it's important to reiterate the question. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, the, the, first, the willing First Nations that are indeed working to move those all-season access roads forward are going to be crucial to the development of the project. Uh, certainly, the, all other northern communities are extremely keen in this, and I hope that the Minister, when he's at the AMO conference, will be meeting with uh, northern communities to discuss and up, update them on this project, but my question again is, will you make the investment necessary to move that all-season road billion. access forward, and will you continue to partner with the First Nations that are indeed willing partners in this project? Response, Minister. Well, the answer can be yes if the member is uh, willing to admit, Mr. Speaker, that there is a dramatic deficit of road access to that region, and for 15 years, very little got done in that respect. Nothing. Okay, let's call it for what it is. Mr. Speaker, the Ring of Fire represents a legacy opportunity not only for the jobs it will create in mining extraction, not only for the economic opportunity of Indigenous communities and municipalities, smelting opportunities, the legacy infrastructure structure required to support that development is as big as the prospect of mining extraction activities itself, Mr. Speaker. We've seen when Indigenous communities get involved in the economic development aspects of this, like Webequay, a small business centre that played a pivotal role in the exploration activities, like uh, communities farther to the south who are now partners Spons. with Moron to make sure that they get jobs, economic opportunities and infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that can create and contribute to vibrant, dynamic Indigenous communities and municipalities. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Day after day, the opposition makes outrageous and, frankly, inappropriate claims about Bill 5. It's what they always do, try to put a negative spin on the great work that we're doing. But we know the real reason the NDP opposes Bill 5 is because they love big government. Higher taxes and job-killing red tape is what they want. It's just in their DNA. But former government members have also made claims, claims that we did not consult. That's just wrong. 
The Premier spoke to thousands of Ontarians and Torontonians during our recent campaign. They sent us here to govern on June 7th with a mandate to reduce the size and cost of government. Minister, or rather, and if sorry. I may say so, we Question. are doing a bang-up job. Yeah, yeah. Can the minister tell the House what is the former government's record on consulting before interfering? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. Thanks, uh, thanks speaker. speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, our outstanding member from Scarborough Centre for that, uh, that very good question. Uh, speaker, I, I, want to, I want to set the record straight. The former government meddled in this year's Toronto election. They did it quietly, without consultation, by slipping Schedule 2 into this oh, year's budget bill. The budget bill. It amended the City of Toronto Act, allowing council to pass a bylaw adding three councillors for this year's vote. Previously, to change the council composition deadline was December 31st of the previous year. Like the NDP, if you give the Liberals a chance, they'll always increase the size and cost of government. Over here, we're respecting taxpayers, and I'm proud. An unmanageable, unaffordable 47-member council is just another Liberal mess that we're going to clean up. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you for that response, Minister, and for explaining how the previous government failed to consult taxpayers in Toronto about changing the rules at the last minute in order to increase council size. Unlike them, the streamlined, lower-cost city council that we are proposing in Bill 5 has been debated for days to to by everyone here. You and the Premier have been open and accountable <laughs> by answering questions both in the House and in the media, something that the previous government simply did not do. I am curious about something, though, Minister, and forgive my possible ignorance. When did the budget pass to give city councillors the go-ahead to add more city councillors to the payroll, and how did it coincide with this year's election? <laughs> I want to again uh, thank the, the member for that uh, excellent question. The budget passed on May the 8th, one week into the municipal election campaign. Oh! So the previous government acted to push their agenda to allow a retroactive increase in the size and cost of Just Toronto Council during the okay. campaign period. It's a little rich. To hear yesterday the member for Don Valley East stand up and criticize us when that MPP from Toronto was a member of cabinet in a government that changed the rules during the game a, a few short months ago. I bet he didn't tell constituents that he was acting to add more councillors to the bill. There's a word for that behavior, Speaker, but I don't think I'm going to use it. The House will please come to order. Still have 24 minutes. <laughs> Start the clock. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. London is grappling with an opioid crisis. London's regional HIV AIDS connection and the Middlesex London Health Unit run a temporary overdose prevention site that has been a saving grace for my community. Supervised injection sites save lives. They're a proven harm reduction tool for combating this public health crisis. Experts in London are ready to talk. Staff in London are ready to talk. Community members and people with lived experience in London are ready to talk. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has been invited to tour the site and talk to experts. We're left wondering, why is a professional, well-run organization being left in the dark? This site is only temporary and will cease to exist come August 15th unless action is taken now. Will this Question. government grant a much-needed extension for the temporary site? Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health. 
Dr. Kerr. Thank you very much for the question. I'm certainly aware of the situation with the supervised injection site in London, Ontario. I do plan to visit. I understand they're doing some great work. As the Premier has said in the past, we want to look at the evidence to make sure that the continuation of all of the supervised injection sites are going to be of benefit to people to save lives and to help introduce people into rehabilitation. The particular site that you're speaking about in London, we are looking at a temporary situation to extend its time for us to be able to to continue with this investigation, and that is what I'm hoping to do within the next few days to make sure that we can do that. We don't want them to stop the work while our investigation is, under, is undergoing. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. There are six days left. My constituents deserve a solid answer. According to the RNAO, there is robust peer-reviewed evidence that these services are saving lives and making a difference. The evidence is ready. All you need to do is take a look at it. To date, staff members have already prevented seven overdoses. Addiction touches everyone and can tear families apart. Staff are saving lives every day, connecting individuals with their community and helping put them on the road to recovery. This site must continue to exist past August 15th. Again, there are six days left. Will this government commit here and now to grant an extension for the temporary site past the August 15th deadline? Minister. Well, the short answer to the member is yes. Yes, I said that in my previous response. conduct our review. We understand there is a big opioid crisis in the situation. I understand that that clinic is being very well used and is doing some very good work. We are going to continue our work looking at the RNO report and the reports of others to make sure that the continued site for this site in London as well as the other supervised injection sites across the province continue. It will also be part of our ongoing review, our mental health and addictions review that we're undergoing, that we are putting $3.8 billion into over the years. We want to make sure that all Ontarians who need help receive that help. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. This week, our government put the people first, and we kept our promise to bring Buck of Beer back to Ontario. As of August 27th, any brewer can choose to lower the price for a beer to a dollar. Can't come soon I'm enough. proud to be part of a government that's working to help people keep more of their hard-earned money in their pockets. Speaker, can the minister provide? Can the minister provide more details about our plans to return Buck of Beer to Ontario? Minister Finance. Well, uh, I want to say thank you to the member from Perth Wellington for the question. And, Speaker, when you get right down to it, our Buck of Beer plan is simply to encourage competition among Ontario's brewing industry and saving consumers money. Let's remember that before 2008, Buck of Beer was popular with both Her consumers and brewers. It was a win win. And then, of course, the Liberals got their hands on it supported by the NDP. They added a layer of red tape when they raised the minimum beer price and made buck a beer illegal. Well, effective August 27th, in time for Labor Day weekend, Speaker, our government is going to lower the minimum beer price to a dollar for any beer under 5.6 per cent alcohol volume. Speaker, promise made, promise kept. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and back to the uh, ever-hard-working Minister of Finance. <laughs> it's important to realize that the Premier's buck of beer challenge is just that, a challenge. It's voluntary. It's going to be completely up to each brewer whether or not they want to lower their prices. And there are no financial incentives being provided here. Yeah. Minister, can you explain how the government is going to implement buck of beer in a fiscally and socially responsible way? Minister.
Speaker, uh, thank you again for the question. We've kept our promise and done our uh, part by lowering the price floor, allowing the beer industry to participate in the Premier's challenge. Any brewer that wants to join can join in on this great marketing opportunity. Instead of handouts and subsidies, we're issuing the Buck a Beer Challenge, and the LCBO will work collaboratively with any brewer wishing to participate with no costs incurred by the Ontario taxpayers. And let's be clear, Speaker, we remain unwavering in our commitment to road responsibility and road safety. We're going to trust consumers to make mature and responsible decisions, but there is zero tolerance for those who do not. We promise to bring Buck of Beer back to Ontario at no cost Pons. to the taxpayers, and we delivered. Promise made, Pons. promise kept. Next question. The member for St. Catharines. Mr. Speaker, St. Catharines saw more than a 300 per cent increase in overdose in the last year and has one of the highest opioid overdose death rates in the province. Mr. Mr. San Mayor Sensick and St. Catharines City Council unanimously called for a safe injection site for the city in January. The future of the site, like other sites in the province, is now in limbo. Does the Premier support a safe injection site for St. Catharines? Questions for the Premier. Mr. Hope. Health and long-term care. Well, thank you very much to the member for the question. As I indicated in a previous question, we are doing an examination of supervised injection sites, the ones that are already open, to understand the benefits and the basis of the evidence for them to be carried on and for perhaps new injection sites to be open in the future. I can't comment on a secure uh, a supervised injection site for St. Catharines until we've conducted our research and I've prevented the recommendations to the Premier on whether the evidence supports continued extension of supervised injection sites in the province. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier, Niagara Regional Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Andrea Feller, points out that a, points out that a map of the region's worst OD rates line up with the region's greatest needs for decent housing and income. Will the Premier continue to bulldoze over evidence-based solutions to combat the opioid crisis and poverty, or will he support a provincially funded safe injection site for St. Catharines and Niagara? Well, thank you. Well, we certainly know there is an opioid problem across Ontario particularly bad in the area where you live. We want to make sure that we put the right programs and services in place to be able to save people's lives, but also to introduce them to rehabilitation wherever we can. That is why we are undertaking an extensive addiction and mental health review to make sure that we put those programs and services into place, whether they're supervised injection sites or other treatment facilities. That is work that we're going to continue over the next number of months, and we invite you to participate in that process because it is important for all Ontarians, that we develop a comprehensive system that serves children to youth to adults to seniors throughout all phases of their life. Great. We want to make sure that we put those provisions Best. in place and do the right thing. Thank you. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. We continue to read and see stories in the media uh, talking about the devastation that the forest fires are causing throughout central and northern Ontario. I know your ministry and the emergency uh, responders and frontline workers are dedicating everything they have to fight these fires. Minister, can you please tell us how our government is helping to support all of those men and women to ensure that they have all the necess necessary resources they need to fight these fires? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, thank the member from Sault Ste. Marie for that question. Uh, this government is committed to ensuring that the province has the necessary resources to, to continue to fight the forest fires in northern and central Ontario. Yesterday, the PC government, under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, announced $100 million in additional Great. funding to continue to support emergency forest fighting for the 2018 fire season. As I've mentioned previously in this House, the 2018 fire season is one of the worst in Ontario's history. The hot, dry conditions and accompanying lightning storms are expected to continue through most of the summer and quite possibly into the fall. 
Our number one priority remains the same day in and day out, and that's the safety of the public and the protection of communities and private property. And this additional funding that we've committed to will ensure that we continue to have the necessary resources there for our frontline here, workers. Here. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister. I am so very happy to hear uh, how our government is uh, so committed to ensuring our emergency responders and frontline workers uh, remain safe and protected and ensure that they can ensure that our people are safe and protected. There are reports in the media suggesting that progress is being made and that many people in northern and central Ontario are very encouraged by some of the improvements uh, in the fire situation over the last week or so. Could you please provide an update to us with respect uh, to uh, the fire situation? Minister. Thanks very much for that uh, supplementary question. And while crews and support staff continue to make progress on the fires across the province, there still are approximately 126 active fires in the province in various stages of control. In particular, I'm very pleased to announce the status of Perry Sound 33 has been upgraded to being held. Good. Crews have been able to maintain the perimeter and work towards the interior, finding hot spots, and they're taking action to extinguish them and to reduce the size of the fire. In other good news, people from the Henby Inlet First Nation have returned to their homes, and we're actively working with communities and other agency partners to discuss when others can safely return to the area. I do want to have her note that this fire is still active and travel restrictions continue to be in place, so we're asking people to cooperate with emergency personnel and listen to their direction. We will continue to fight these fires aggressively on the ground and in the air. Response. The $100 million in additional funding will help us sustain these efforts to manage and suppress the fires. And again, thank you to the frontline workers who are protecting the public. We start the clock. Next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. During National Addictions Awareness Week in 2013, the Deputy Premier said, quote, We have young people with addiction problems who can't sit on a wait list, waiting list for treatment for two years. End quote. In five years since the Deputy Premier raised this issue, wait lists have ballooned to unimaginable lengths and supports have been stretched beyond the breaking point. So I was shocked that this government would look at this crisis and choose to cut mental health funding by $330 million per year. Given the crisis in mental health, how does the Premier justify cutting services for people who are in desperate need of support? Great question. Minister of Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question, uh, although I disagree with it entirely. First of all, what we are actually doing is adding money to the mental health and addiction system. We're adding $1.9 billion to match the $1.9 billion that's being advanced by the federal government. $3.8 billion over 10 years is a lot of money. It's going to allow us to do a lot of work together to create a connected system instead of the piecemeal bits and pieces that we had under 15 years with the Liberals. So I'm not surprised that nothing has improved in the last five years because they didn't put their minds to it. They didn't create a system. We are going to change that. We are going to make sure that we speak with people that are, have lived experience, with the experts, with people in a number of ministries who are involved Spons. in this, because it's not just the Ministry of Health. It's about 12 different ministries. That's the work that we're going to do over the next short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, back to the Premier. At the same time this government is cutting mental health funding, they are giving a six-figure salary government to side come to order. Speaker, can I please get some order so I can actually deliver my question in some civility in this House? Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, at the time— The member's quite right. I have to be able to hear her. The government side needs to come to order. Back to the member. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, at the time this government is cutting mental health funding, they are giving a six-figure salary to their rich friend, Reuben Devlin, to duplicate the job of the Minister of Health. Speaker, this is simply shameful and inefficient for this government. Will this government stop making people in crisis pay to pad the pockets of wallets of Conservative friends and instead support my motion and commit to funding mental health, addictions and supportive housing by at least 
$2.4 billion over the next four years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would say through you to the member that just because you say something time and time again, it doesn't make it any more true on the 50th anniversary. I think it's really important for the people of Ontario who are watching these proceedings to understand that what we are doing is adding adding to our mental health and addiction funding a record amount of money 3.8 billion dollars to create a more comprehensive system to make sure that we have the community capacity to serve people with mental health and addiction needs to make sure that we can build housing so that they will have a safe place to live there is a lot of work to be done and that's a lot of money to do it with we are adding to the system Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Nuclear energy is a safe, clean, and reliable source of electricity in our province, a source that meets over 50% of our electricity needs. Mr. Speaker, 14% of that is provided by the Pickering Nuclear Generation Generating Station. Speaker, the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station is vital to the Durham region and my riding of Northumberland Peterborough South. In fact, over 4,500 jobs in the region depend on this facility, jobs that would have been lost had the NDP won that last election. This government is committed to extending Pickering's operating license until 2024. Can the minister provide an update on the status of this license and explain what actions this government is taking? to protect jobs in the province of Ontario. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Great, great question, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Northumberland Peterborough uh, for that uh, important question. Nuclear power is the backbone of our electricity system. It produces over half of Ontario's electricity. The Picking, Pick, Pickering Nuclear Generating Station alone provides power to 1.5 million homes every day. That's why, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to inform this legislature, and in particular, the member from Pickering Uxbridge to announce that the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station has received approval from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to continue to operate until 2020. This license, this license to This, this license to continue to operate will keep 4,500 good jobs in Durham Region and another 3,000 jobs across the province. That's 7,500 safe jobs. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his leadership on this file. Further to my last question, Mr. Speaker, this announcement is great news for the people of Durham and Northumberland. They know. That's why they gave us this mandate, that they would have lost their jobs under the reckless NDP. Mr. Speaker, this announcement doesn't only help protect jobs, Mr. Speaker. It's also great news for Ontario ratepayers. Through this government's leadership in ensuring Pickering is operational until 2024, Ontario families, small businesses and job creators will save hundreds of millions of dollars in electricity. Promise made, Mr. Speaker. Promise kept. Can the minister tell the members of this House— Question. He's doing such a great job. Can the minister tell the members of this House what impact this announcement will have on all Ontarians and why he's so energized to save jobs in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. It's, it's, thank you for that question, Mr. Speaker. It's true. The Premier made a commitment to the people of Ontario to keep the Pickering Station operational until 2024. Wait for it, Mr. Speaker. Promise made. Promise made. 
This extension will save Ontario's electricity customers up to $600 million alongside wow. protecting 7,500 good jobs in our provinces, 7,500 jobs that the anti-nuclear Democratic Party would have eliminated. Mr. Speaker. Pickering Nuclear provides 14 per cent of our province's electricity every day. The continued operation until 2024 is expected to contribute over $12.3 billion to Ontario's GDP. I'm proud to say we're doing all of this in a safe and reliable uh, facility, Mr. Speaker, one of the safest facilities uh, we have and one of our government's core commitments to keep more money in people's pockets. Yeah. Promise made. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. An investigation has shown that black and brown individuals are stopped by police at a rate of five to ten times more than the rest of the population. The previous government could have banned the practice of arbitrary street checks, but they didn't. Today, I will introduce a motion to end the practice of carding, or was also known as street checks, in the province once and for all. Will the Premier support this motion? Premier. Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. As we've always stated, public safety is of paramount concern to this government. The Premier has been clear from day one on this matter, and we will not be bringing back carding. As you know, I believe in giving our law enforcement officers the tools they need to get the job done. I will listen to our frontline work officers about the resources they need, and I will make sure that we're working with communities to ensure that we're building trust between our police and the communities they serve. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people includes every person in this great province, and we remain committed to enhancing and ensuring public Response. safety for all Ontarians across this great province. Ontario is an inclusive province where all are respected, no matter their background, nationality, faith, or race. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, now we know how this went the last time I asked the government if they would end police use of carding. Does the police, does the Premier rather, support the use of carding or street checks by police? Yes or no? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've uh, stated in the past, public safety is of paramount concern to us, and we want to ensure that the people, the police officers that serve our communities, have the tools they need to conduct their work. In order for the frontline workers to do their work, they need resources. And as you know, today we've committed to $25 million in additional funding. As you can appreciate, the police, we require police to work in communities. We require police to engage with people in the communities, and we're giving them the tools to be able to do that. The long, in the long run, what we're trying to do is ensure that the communities are safe and that individuals have the confidence, not only in our government, to do what's right for them, but also to ensure that they feel safe and are able to enjoy our festivals, to enjoy the streets, to be able to walk freely. That's what. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Members will take their seats. Next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Minister, we campaigned as the PCs and promises to put money back in people's pockets, clean up the hydro mess, bring back accountability and trust, create good jobs, and reduce hospital wait times. Minister, can you tell me what you and your colleagues are doing to make these promise made, promise kept? Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. I, I, I did hear that question loud and clear, and I thank the member uh, who's sitting right next to me for that question. And it's a very good question because it's a rare opportunity for the Ontario Legislature to sit here during the summer months 
in such close proximity to the election of June 7th. And the one thing that Premier Ford wanted to do after winning the election, with a decisive majority, I might add, 76. was to get back to work here at Queen's Park and start to fulfill some of those promises yeah, yeah. that we made during that election. So, Mr. Speaker, to that end, we have already started to clean up the Liberal Hydro mess. We put new leadership in place and new board governance at Hydro One. We're reducing the cost of electricity by cancelling uh, renewable energy projects that were going to drive up the cost of electricity by almost $800 million, Mr. Speaker. We got kids back to school at York University for this fall. We're unwinding the cap and trade program. We're even selling beer for a buck now in Ontario, Mr. Time we have this morning for question period. Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to wish uh, Sullivan one of the pages here a birthday. He's having that on Saturday. For those pages that may not be with us next week, thank you so much for your service. Yeah. And one of our members, uh, MPP Barber, is also having your birthday today. The Attorney General on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to welcome my children to the House for the first time. Lewis Piercy and Miranda, and let they get the opportunity to see what all that door knocking meant to their mother. Thank you. Oh, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services on a point of order. A quick point of order, one to correct my record. Uh, the individual that Ill illegally crossed the border uh, was detained in Quebec. Thank you. Thank you. We now have a deferred vote on the amendment to the amendment to Government Notice of Motion Number Four by Mr. This is the member for Timiskaming and Cochrane. We have deferred vote on the amendment to the amendment to Government Notice of Motion Number Four relating to allocation of time on Bill Five, an act to amend the City of Toronto Act 2006 the Municipal Act 2001, and the Municipal Elections Act 1996. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
I would ask the members to please take their seats. Is everyone in their seat? I think they are. Earlier today, Mr. Vantoff moved that the amendment to government notice of motion be amended by deleting that, except in the case of a recorded division arising from morning orders of the day, pursuant to Standing Order 9C, no deferral of the second reading or third reading vote shall be permitted, and replace it with, the votes on second and third reading may be deferred pursuant to Standing Order 28H. And all those in favour of Mr. Vantoff's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbitt. Mr. Tabbitt. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Shibby Song. Ms. Shibby Song. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Beagle. Ms. Beagle. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Carnahan. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Bogwan. Ms. Bogwan. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Harvey. Mr. Harvey. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Mayor Quinty. Mr. Smith, Mayor Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoca. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoca. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Key. Mr. Key. Mr. Calando. Mr. Calando. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Trianta Philopolis. Mrs. Trianta Philopolis. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Samar. Mrs. Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Bowman. Mr. Bowman. Uh, Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigasi. Mr. Tanigasi. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. The ayes are 32, the nays are 70. The ayes being 32 and the nays being 70, I declare the motion lost. Are the members ready to vote on the amendment to government notice of motion number four? I heard some notes. I heard some notes. There being no more deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>